In honor of mothers everywhere, I'd like to introduce you to my late mother, Pearl. Now, sometimes I would call her Mambo because you see those shoes? Those shoes did a lot of dancing. If you had a mother like I did, you would have enough information to write a book as I did. More about the book later. I may even read you some excerpts from the book. But I feel like I had the most incredible mother ever. And I hope that these pictures that I'm going to share with you will demonstrate some of that. I'll be sharing some stories as well. So in this photograph, it's my mother on the left. She's about 25 there, my dad. And then next to my dad is Pearl's mother, my grandmother, Rose. Rose had taken the couple on a beautiful cruise to Bermuda after I was about two years old. They had not previously had a honeymoon. So she treated them to this beautiful voyage. I was left behind with an elderly couple who were friends of my dad's. And I guess I was just beginning to speak. So all I could say was, mommy and daddy are rocking the boat in Muda. They were actually in Bermuda. And with all the dancing that they were probably doing, they may very well have been rocking that boat. Not only was my mother an accomplished dancer, but she showed a lot of talent as an artist. This is a sculpture that she made of me when I was about three and a half or four years old. I was still in nursery school at a little community center, not far from where we lived. And she was taking an art class in the same building after my day of school ended, I would come into her art class and they had me modeling for them. So my mother wasn't the only person who sculpted me, but I think hers was probably the best. It's almost as if someone took a casting of my head. It's practically an exact replica of how I looked at that age. After Pearl divorced my dad. She put her artistic talents to great use, establishing Philadelphia's first beauty salon for dogs. By this time, we had our own apricot French poodle named Simone, and mother named her salon after our dog, Shea Simone. I'd like to read you a little excerpt from my book. Pearl took Simone everywhere. She had to. Our apartment building didn't allow dogs. Simone was lovely. Yet even a well-mannered pooch couldn't help but yip occasionally when someone passed by her front door. We smuggled her in and out of the building through the service entrance, which led to the parking lot where our car was parked. Pearl employed either a large handbag or she carried Simone draped over her arm concealed beneath the then popular mink stole. Come Halloween, Pearl made a costume for my canine sibling out of a pillowcase with a hole cut out for each eye, a la Casper the Friendly Ghost. Because there were no children in our apartment building, trick-or-treating entailed Pearl driving me and Simone to nearby private homes that would be paired with candy. As my pet and I walked up the street from house to house collecting goodies in the dark, Pearl followed alongside in the car, keeping a protective watch. We even took Simone to the movies with us. She sat on my lap as we watched Walter Lang's film Can Can, in which Shirley MacLaine played a character named Simone. Every time Frank Sinatra called out her name, our Simone woofed woofed and sat wrapped. Who wouldn't swoon if Sinatra was talking to them? 
I could just go on and on about my mother's dog salon. Her customers were some of the most colorful people you can imagine. And I describe a number of them in the book. Uh, an interior decorator who had his chauffeur deliver his seven dogs to her shop. Larry of the Three Stooges was her customer. Patty LaBelle, another famous Philadelphian, brought her dog to my mom. My mother was the contact point for all of Philadelphia's dogs, it seemed. She had a really thriving business. It was very, very hard work. But as hard as she worked, she played equally hard. Here she is on the diving board at the famous Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida. This picture is probably from the early 60s, I'm guessing. We used to go there every Christmas vacation and my mother really loved to sunbathe. You can see she's got a pretty good start for a tan here. As she got on in years, she found that Philadelphia winters were too harsh for her. So she would take an apartment, a furnished apartment in Marina Del Rey, California. And she wanted to have a car out there. She picked up this used Volvo. It was a 1964, I believe, but it sure looked like it was out of the 1940s. And this car had a personality comparable to Pearl's. For starters, the speedometer was a horizontal bar that grew as you accelerated, which totally cracked her up. It also had this pesky little thing with the steering wheel. After you parked, if you did turn the wheel, when you would go to start the car up again, the horn would honk and it wouldn't stop honking. It was a continuous like wah that would wake the whole neighborhood late at night. We had a lot of fun with this car and you can see she looks pretty happy driving it. On this day, my mother was celebrating her 40th reunion from high school. I remember dropping her off at the catering hall and I thought she looked just so beautiful in her pearls, which I'll show you later on. These are now mine. This is my mother on my wedding day. In this photo, she was 60 years old. She never colored her hair. It's so incredible. Even our wedding photographer got a kick out of my mother. After he snapped this shot of her helping me pin the bustle on my gown, he asked permission to use it on one of his publicity brochures, which of course I granted him. So let me read another little excerpt from my book. The mother of the bride had to be prepared to dance with the groom. Since Pearl had been such a phenomenal dancer in her time, I knew she would be looking forward to showing off her dancing prowess in front of 200 friends and family on the biggest stage of her life. I suggested that she and my fiance might want to practice a few moves together in preparation for our big day. We put on some music and Pearl got up from her seat at the glass and chrome dining table. She took Barry's hand and they began to dance. After just a few steps, Pearl quickly lost her breath and became shockingly aware of how out of shape she had become. The reality was as crystal clear as her grandmother's collection of World War I American Brilliant Glass on the nearby Etagere. She might not be able to strut her stuff unless she took immediate massive action to drop some weight and improve her lung capacity. And so she did. She's about 60 or 70 pounds thinner here than when she first tried to dance with my husband. As I mentioned before, if you had a mother this colorful, 
you too would have enough material to write a book. After my mother passed away, I took a year of my life to gather all of her papers and all of the matchbook covers and all of the date books and all of the other ephemera, canceled checks and whatnot, and put together a story of her life and all of the many, many escapades that she enjoyed. I miss her every day. And I dedicate the next section in many of my podcasts to her pearls of wisdom. My mother's birthday often fell on the same date as Mother's Day. And I often felt she got gypped out of two separate presents. So I always tried to make it really special for her. I never had an opportunity to read her this poem. I found it after she had passed away, but I thought it was so beautiful, the artwork around it, that I wanted to share it with you. To my mother, some of us have so very much that we may be thankful for, that it little behooves us to envy those who may seem to have more. And when I think over my blessings, as so very often I do, I believe that I am most grateful of all for having a mother like you. I couldn't have said it better myself. I am so grateful to have had this mother who taught me everything I know about being a mother. She was one of a kind. There'll never be another pearl quite like her. And by the way, She's the one who taught me to knit. I have her to thank for that. I have shown you some of my mother's pearls before, but today I'm just gonna quickly run through several sets of pearls that she had. After all, her name was Pearl, so you would expect her to have pearls, right? So these are Biwa pearls. This is a blood coral clasp. And how many strands? We have five strands that are graduated. It's really tricky to put this on. You have to get it just right. Typically, these decorative clasps would have been worn on the side. Of course, you can wear it in the front. I think most of the time my mother wore it on the side asymmetrically, but it, it can be worn like so or with the clasp in the back, certainly. Okay, now I'm gonna do Jeannie. This next strand originally belonged to my grandmother and has matching earrings. These are blue, they're natural, they're not dyed. And there's a very pretty clasp on these as well. Let me take them off so you can see the length of them. And I'll bring this clasp closer to you. There are little sapphires going around the edge. They're very, very pretty. I don't have many occasions to wear a lot of these, but I am happy to have these family heirlooms. Speaking of heirlooms, this ring belonged to that grandmother. She was engaged in 1920, so it's a, an authentic Art Deco piece. These are double strand, also with the asymmetrical clasp. They've been cooped up in a little jewelry roll. After these have been out for a while, they'll hang better without puckering up. And that's how long these are. Not super long, but long enough for me to take over my head without undoing the clasp. The clasp has little opals in it. And again, it's that flower motif, real popular in the 60s. The last set I wanted to show you has a blister pearl on its clasp. It's also double strand, quite long. Of course, as you saw, my mother was wearing these in her 40th reunion picture. 
on her, they were a good length and she had a much larger chest than I have. So on me, they're, they're quite long. I want to take them off to show you. Just how long they are. Um, and there's a, a little bit of a knack to putting these kinds of pearls on when they're double stranded like this. Usually they're strung so that one strand will nest inside of the other. And you have to make sure that you have the clasp on the right side, as opposed to, you know, I could turn this inside out and then they'll crisscross, they won't hang properly. So you have a little bit of a juggling act to get them oriented correctly. My mother had these pearls sitting in a case somewhere. One of the strands had broken and although she didn't lose any pearls, they were in desperate need of restringing. I never priced out how expensive it is to have these restrung, but because they're particularly long and a double strand, I knew that it would be prohibitive. So I taught myself how to do it. She already had the stringing thread and the special kind of needle that went through the pearl, but getting the knot to be in between and just the right place is quite a skill. Um, it's not so easily done. My stringing isn't perfect, but I don't think that I'll lose them. At least I hope not. Um, that's the point of having them knotted in between the beads. If they do break, you might only lose one, one pearl where that break is. All the others should be knotted into place. So it's essential to have them knotted. And the closer the, the knots are, like there really shouldn't be this kind of movement. That's because I strongly am not a professional. Also, these pearls are not spherical. You can see they have a little bit of an irregular shape to them, which makes it a little harder to knot them, especially when you get one like this. very unusual shape and you don't want to interrupt that by you know, breaking it off by pushing something up too close to it. I hope you enjoyed that little segment. I know my mother is looking down very fondly. She would be very happy to know that I'm enjoying wearing these from time to time. Thanks mother. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there. Thanks for watching.